Well, good afternoon, church family. I'd like to welcome our visitors and our guests here at the Three Angels Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we hope this won't be your last time visiting with us. What a privilege it is to be able to stand before you to present the Word of God. I do not take this lightly. And uh, I would like to invite His Holy Presence as we talk about a timely message. So before we begin, I would like to ask if we could please bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, help us. Amen. The title of my talk today is Finish the Course. And my objective and what I would like to do is to give a message of encouragement this morning. Encouragement for what we're about to go through and what we are going through in these last days. And as long as we put Jesus first in our lives, as long as he is first in our lives, we're going to go through a lot of different things. At this time, please turn with me in your Bibles to our scripture reading, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, I'd like to read seven, uh, verse um, 7 and 8, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. It says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course, and I have, and I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Brothers and sisters, it's time to fight. It's time to stand for truth. But we can't fight this fight or finish the course without the strength of Jesus. Amen. Should we seven-day Adventists relax at a time like this? Should we seven-day Adventists sleep when we should be warning the people of Jesus' return? Amen. Should we seven-day Adventists lay down our armor when we know there is a war going on? All of our capabilities, our power should be devoted to Jesus Christ. Our time, our money, our hearts, our minds should be first devoted to Jesus. And if our hearts belong to God, we will stand against Satan's and his human agents and will not flinch a muscle. If our minds belong to God, rejection Persecution and alienation will not bother us. It doesn't matter of our race, of our age, or our race. If we believe, God will bless us. Mm -hmm. He will give us what we need in order to finish the course. Amen? Yeah. I'd like to ask a few questions this morning or this afternoon. Whether it's in your home, whether it's on your job, whether it's in the world, are we fighting? the good fight, my brothers and sisters. Are we willing to go through the fire in the name of Jesus? Are we willing to stand for the Sabbath when our jobs tell us it's mandatory to come in and work? Are we willing to share the love of Jesus even though it's not a popular message? Are we willing to stand up against the Pharisees and the Sadducees of our day when they are preaching and teaching false doctrine in the churches? Some of our church leaders, they won't stand against sin. They won't stand against Satan. They won't stand against the homosexual lifestyle, fornication, adultery, and false doctrine. They just won't stand, my brothers and sisters. They won't stand against sin. You know why? It's because they don't want their own sins revealed. 
Proverbs 27, 5 says, open rebuke is better than secret love. Amen. In the book, Last Day Events, by our prophet Ellen G. White, page 159, I like to read it. Please pay close attention to this. It says, the Lord has shown me what would take place just before the close of probation. Every, not some, it says every uncouth thing will be demonstrated. And we're talking about in the church. There will be shouting with drums and music and dancing. The senses of rational beings will become so confused that they cannot be trusted to make right decisions. A bedlam of noise shocks the senses and perverts that which if conducted aright might be a blessing. The powers of satanic agencies blend with the din and noise to have a carnival, and this is termed the Holy Spirit's working. So in other words, being deceived. With all the things that are going on in the church, the dancing and the drums, the loud music, it says that Satan is entertained and he comes in. And when that happens, guess who's not there? God is not there. It goes on to say those things which have been in the past will be in the future. Satan will make music a snare by the way in which it is conducted. Let us give no strange exercising, no place, excuse me, let us give no place to strange exercising which really take the mind away from deep movings of the Holy Spirit. God's work is ever characterized by calmness and dignity. Amen. What uncouth things, you might ask, is being displayed in some of our churches. Lying spirits in contradiction of the scriptures and the spirit of prophecy. We want to use it and twist it around so we're going to fill our own lifestyle so we'll feel okay and justified in, in our sins. False revivals and worship services. The ungodly music that is being played. I mean, there should be a difference when you walk in church. You shouldn't feel at home as if you're going to the clubs. Speaking in tongues. And evil angels appear as human beings. Some time ago, as I was witnessing, I was talking to an older lady, and she said to me that her goal was to come into the churches and disrupt. And I said, what do you mean? Well, you have to remember this lady, she worshipped Satan. Now, I'm not talking about backsliding. I'm not talking about doing demonic things. I'm talking about she actually went into a church and worshipped Satan himself. She said her goal was to go inside the churches in any church. It didn't matter. And her goal was to befriend the women and to seduce the men. And I'm talking about from the pastors all the way to the men that sat in the pews. When you realize in history what Satan did, he tried to attack the church from the outside and didn't work. What did he do? He came in through the middle, at the inside. This, at the time she was a young lady, she's an older woman now, and you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that she turned from her sins and she asked for forgiveness. But at the time she told me that when she came in, she had one objective, to disrupt homes, to disrupt families, and to disrupt the church. We have to be careful, my brothers and sisters. Just because they walk in with a fancy suit and a fancy dress, it doesn't mean that they're of God. We have to test them by their fruits. You best believe that Satan will send his agents to tear up the church. And he's going to try to do it from within. We have to protect ourselves. That's why it's so important that we ask for God to put a hedge around our families, around our homes, and around our churches. You can witness now on social media all this, the seven day Adventist churches. Now is what I'm talking about. Look at the things that is going on in our churches. It's an abomination. And he already told us, as he told them, 
your house will be left unto you desolate. Yes. I want Jesus to be with us when we worship. Amen? Amen. Yes. If you notice in 2 Timothy 4, 7, it is broken down into three parts. It says what? Number one, fight the good fight. Number two, finish the course. And number three, keep the faith. Not obtain it, but to keep it. We have to ask ourselves, church family, are we actually fighting the good fight or are we faking it? Are we true Christians or are we faking it? Do we truly forgive someone when they have hurt us or are we faking it? When you come in on Sabbath morning and you look someone in the face and say, happy Sabbath, are you being genuine or are we faking it? When I was younger, I used to, my mid-teens or so, I used to box. And one of the things that I found out is that if you don't train, if you're not physically and mentally prepared, you are guaranteed to lose the fight. We would be in the gym 10 or 15 hours a week, sit-ups and push-ups and running and lifting weights and sparring. And we were doing all this for the main event, for the championship fight. We would stay, we would have to stay focused, my brothers and sisters, because one false move could cost me the fight. But most importantly, I had to know who my opponent was. I had to know of their capabilities and what their weaknesses and strengths were. Brothers and sisters, whether we want to accept it or not, we are in a fight every day with Satan and ourselves. We are in a fight with his demons, with his human agents that he sends to get us to not finish the course. Now is not the time to relax, my church family, my friends, now is not the time to take it easy. If we do that, we might as well just throw in the towel. There'll be times that we'll be up against the ropes and there'll be times that we might even get knocked down. But we have to get back up and fight the good fight in the name of Jesus. You see, our training, our training is daily devotion with Jesus. Our training is coming to church every Sabbath. Our training is attending prayer meeting. Our training is attending Bible studies and seminars and, and other programs that will strengthen ourselves for this fight that we're in. Amen. That will strengthen Amen. ourselves for the enemy. Because friends, if we don't train, we're setting ourselves up for failure and we will lose this spiritual fight that we're in. If we want to win, if we want to make heaven our home, we have to invite Jesus into our corner. We have to invite Jesus into our lives and in our hearts. Amen. Turn with me to 1 Timothy, please. 1 Timothy chapter 6. It says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Hold on to eternal life. Don't let it go. Whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Our only security, my friends, my church family, our only security against Satan is to keep ourselves constantly under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And at the same time, engaging ourselves in his word that will be imbued in us. Yes. Church family, are we wanting to hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant, uttered from our Savior's lips? Are we wanting to hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant, uttered from Jesus' lips? Can you imagine as we get to heaven and we're kneeling down before him and he placed that crown of righteousness on our head? Can you imagine? Can you imagine it, church family? If so, we need to be engaging in personal Bible studies. 
We should be inviting to pe people to church to hear the word of God being preached and taught. One of my favorite examples of fighting the good fight is in the book of Acts. Turn with me to Acts chapter 6, please. Acts, uh, Acts chapter 6, verse 1. And it says, and in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them, and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among ye seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. In verse 5, And the same pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procarius, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, the Priscillite of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. When we read that Stephen, a true man of God, was chosen to be a deacon by the disciples. See, at this time, the church, you can read that the church selected seven men full of faith and wisdom and of the Holy Spirit. Stephen, he was chosen first. Why? Well, Stephen was a Jew and he, he knew the religion, but he also still, uh, spoke the Greek language and he was familiar with the custom and manners of the Greeks. So he was considered, obviously, the logical person to be in charge of the disbursement of the funds dealing with the widows, the orphans, and also the poor. So the decision to put Stephen in charge was the best decision. And once that happened, you'll notice that all the dissatisfaction and the murmuring, it stopped. But that's not the end of it. When we continue to read in verses 8 through 15, it shows how Stephen was set up by the church. Does this sound familiar? Let's go to verse 8, starting in verse 8. It says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain in the synagogue, which is called the synagogues of the Libertines, and the Cyrenians, and the Alexandrians, and, the, and them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they supported, then the, they supported men, which said, We have heard him speak black, blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people, and the elders, and the scribes, and came upon him, and caught him, and brought him to the council, and set up false witnesses, which said, this man ceased not to speak blasphemous words against the holy place and the law. In verse 14. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. In 15 it says, And all that sat in the council looked steadfastly on him, saw his face, and has been the face of an angel. Friends, as the priests and the rulers and the pastors and the conference leaders saw the power of God in Stephen as he preached, guess what happened? They were filled with bitter hatred towards him. 
You see, instead of yielding and listening to the evidence that Stephen presented, they determined to silence his voice by putting him to death. Does this sound familiar? On several of occasions, they had bribed the Roman authorities to look the other way as they took the law into their own hands, condemning and executing prisoners according to their own will and wants. The enemies of Stephen, they were confident that they continued down this course without any repercussions, without any consequences of danger in themselves. They determined to risk in consequence of Stephen preaching this gospel. They wanted to seize Stephen and bring him before the Sanhedrin, San, excuse me, Sanhedrin Council for Trial. Sanhedrin Council for Trial. If you haven't been paying attention, church family, Stephen, he was set up. Stephen was set up by the church leaders, as was Jesus Christ. Does this sound familiar? My question is, are we ready to be set up, church family? Are we ready to be set up, my friends? Are we ready to stare persecution in the face? Are we ready for Satan's attacks that will come from those closest to us? Are we wanting to finish the course? Well, if we're true followers of God, We have to have strong backs to bear the cross as Jesus did. We have to have strong knees to spend as much time in prayer as Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane. We have to have humble hearts and a humble spirit in the midst of persecution as Jesus did when he was brought before the church. When you read in chapter 7, you will find out here where Stephen made his position known. You will find out what he stood for and what he believed in. If we go to Acts chapter 7 starting in verse 51, I'd like to play, pay close attention to what is being said by Stephen. Verse 51 it says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in the heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers do, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which have showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. Who have received the law by the disposition of angels, and have not kept it. Verse 54 says, When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Meaning they were angry at Stephen for speaking the truth. Galatians 4.16 says, Have I now become your enemy because I tell you the truth? As we keep reading in verse 55, we witness Stephen being killed for what he believed in. We read that Stephen was killed for the sake of Jesus because the priests and the rulers, they couldn't prevail against Stephen because the Holy Spirit was with him. And because of this, they determined, they were determined to make an example of him. In doing so, their objective was to put fear in all those who believed as Stephen did. They wanted to make Stephen the example. Does this sound familiar? Yeah. Acts 7.55, going back to the story, it says, But he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him. 
And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the young man's feet, whose name was Saul. We're going to talk about Saul a little later. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And in verse 60, it says, he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. How powerful is it as he's kneeling on the ground and he looks up at those who are persecuting him and asks Jesus not to hold them to what they're doing. We have such a hard time in the days we live in just to forgive. But this is what it means when Stephen, he had the love of Jesus and he had the Holy Spirit with him that even on his deathbed, on his on, as he is kneeling down here, he is saying, Lord, please forgive them. The same thing that Jesus did. See, the death of Stephen, it was a turning point in, in history. How he stood and died for what he believed in. And he made a deep impression upon all those who saw and, and witnessed this event. With the glory of God upon his face, and as he spoke those words, it touched every soul. It touched every one that witnessed this event. His words left a residue of God's love in the minds of all those who were there and testified to the truth of that which he had proclaimed. You know, sometimes when we do stand for truth, there are times we don't have to say anything, but everything that Stephen did, do you realize that when people saw that, they saw the love of God in him? And because of that, their lives changed. It's our words, it's even our actions as Stephen, as Jesus Christ stood before in a mock court trial. And he took on all the persecution. He didn't say a word. But he died for what he believed in. Stephen died for what he believed in. Will we die for what we believe in? You see, brothers and sisters, Stephen, he fought a good fight. He finished the course and he kept the faith. The sad part, the sad part is that some of us haven't even put on the armor of God to prepare for battle. Some of us haven't even started the course in which Jesus and Paul and Stephen and others finished. Do we know and understand, do we know and understand that Jesus is on his way? We need to be in a state of emergency, church family. We need to have a sense of urgency of getting the word out and giving Bible studies and inviting people to church and passing out literature. Brothers and sisters, we have to keep the faith. When we take a good look at all the things we have going on in our lives, when we look at all the things that are hindering us from fighting the good fight against Satan and to win souls for Jesus, is it worth it? Are these worldly things worth not seeing Jesus in peace? Is it worth losing what 2 Timothy 4, 8 has in store for us if we fight the good fight, if we finish the course, and if we keep the faith? Verse 8, it says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me that day, and not to me only, but unto all them, that also love his appearing. Are you prepared, my church family, to fight the good fight, to finish the course and to keep the faith? You see, Paul, who had previously been known as a zealous defender of the Jewish religion and a persecutor of the followers of Christ, he uttered those very words before his death. Throughout his Later ministry, Paul never lost sight of the source and wisdom of his strength, which was Jesus. 
He never took his eyes off of Jesus. And brothers and sisters, we can't do the same thing. We have to keep our eyes on Jesus no matter what we go through. I've always hear the words, turn your eyes upon Jesus, and I never knew really what it meant until years later that if we look up to Jesus, everything around us will go strangely dim. Paul and Stephen, they kept their eyes on Jesus. Amen. Paul, he felt sure that these teachers of Israel, these conference leaders, these Pastors, these elders and deacons with whom he was once friends with at one point was sincere and honest as he had been. But eventually things started coming to light about his Jewish brethren and in the hopes of them standing for truth, Paul was sadly disappointed. I've been there, church family, I've been there. When you feel that your close friends or your close family standing for truth and when things get hard, when things, you know, doesn't look so good, they start to backpedal, they start to question themselves. The friends that you thought would stand for truth and all of a sudden you don't see them anymore. I've been there, church family. It does hurt. Paul was in a position now where he couldn't count on his friends who he thought would stand for truth. Church family, the same thing is happening in our churches today. Those who we thought would stand for truth have given in to the majority for the sake of peace. Matthew 10, 34 says otherwise. Those who we thought would stand for truth have turned their heads for the fear of being talked about for the fear of being kicked out and disfellowshipped from the church. But I must share with you that man doesn't have the final say. God does. And at the end of the day, can we look at ourselves in the mirror? Can we be pleased with what we see? Most importantly, will the Lord be pleased with what he sees when he looks at us? It is time to stop compromising, church family. It is time to stop compromising, call sin what it is, and yes. preach the truth. Yes, that's right. There's a famous quote by Dr. Martin Luther King. I love this quote. And it says, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Read it one more time. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Church family, my brothers and sisters, we have to speak and stand for the truth. We have to live and uphold the word of God and his standards. As we go through strip, uh, scripture, we come to know the events and trials that Paul himself went through. We see how Satan tried to attack him every step of the way. And we better know and understand that these type of things will also happen to us. Acts 13. I'm going to run down these real fast, but Acts 13 is where I'm at right now. Verses 6 through 12. You will find that Paul had to deal with the sorcerer named Bar Jesus. In Acts 13, 45, Paul had to deal with his own people, the Jews, because of the truth he spoke. They were filled with envy and spoke against Paul's teachings. In Acts 13, 48 through 52, the Gentiles were glad to hear his words, but the Jews were upset and sought out to persecute Paul and kick him out of the land. In Acts 14, 1 through 7, he was stoned in a city called Inconium by the Jews. In Acts chapter 16, Paul was put in jail, but while he was in jail, he was witnessing and he converted some of the guards. 
In Acts 22, 31 through 33, while back in Jerusalem, Paul was beaten and arrested while in the temple. <coughs> Excuse me. Chapter 23, Paul was brought before the council. In the meeting, Paul spoke the word of God to the men and he even rebuked them. And they were angry with Paul. So what did they do? Sound familiar? They plotted to kill Paul in verses 12 and 22. In Acts chapter 25, he was brought before Phoenix and then before King Agrippa. Because Paul was a Roman citizen, he was shipped back to Rome where he was supposed to be put in prison. On the way back to Rome, he was shipwrecked. While under guard, Paul did what? He still preached the word of God. You see, Paul was in Rome. When he was there, he preached on these things. He, he preached the consequences of being ungodly and unrighteous. He preached about the judgment of God and the faithfulness of God and righteousness by faith. Paul spoke on the fruits of justification by faith, being dead to sin, alive to God. He spoke on slaves to righteousness and having union with Christ and a whole lot more. As we fast forward during Paul's final trial before Nero, the emperor was very impressed at one point with Paul's words. At some point he couldn't decide whether he believed it or he didn't. But eventually, Paul's words started cutting deep and the emperor had hate, hatred and malice towards Paul. Not long after that, Nero pronounced the decision to do what? Condemn Paul to a martyr's death. And because Paul was a Roman citizen, they couldn't torture him like they would do everybody else. What they did was they just sentenced him to beheading. So in 2 Timothy 4, 6, Paul knew that his time was up. But the thing about it is, Paul, he already made up in his mind, as we are going to have to do, my brothers and sisters, he already made up in his mind that he was going to follow Jesus no matter what. And we're going to have to do the same thing. John 4, 34, Jesus talking to the disciples, he said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Why are we constantly being distracted? Satan wants us distracted from finishing his work. We have all the other things that are going on and then Satan comes into some of our churches causing strife, but we're not paying attention as Nehemiah did and building the wall instead of worrying about the murmuring and all the other things that are taking place. We need to be focused on finishing the work. Amen. We need to be focused on getting our lives together because if not, we're going to miss out on heaven. And it is nobody's fault but mine. I'm here to encourage you, my friends. I'm here to encourage you that as long as we are imbued with the love and spirit of Jesus, as Stephen and Paul was, we have nothing to worry about. As long as we stand for the truth, as long as we stand with and for Jesus, there will be a crown of righteousness waiting for us in heaven. That's my goal. Is that your goal? Do you believe that? Do you believe it in your heart? We all know as we look at current events, we know that the Pope was just here. We read about it on, face, uh, on um, Facebook and we read it on the social media. We always see the things that are going on and we say, oh man, it's wrapping up. Oh, we do, are we prepared for it is my question. Amen. Do we realize that the Pope was here and he was in trying to indoctrinate his Catholic theology on he wants a one world religion, a one world order. Right. Do we realize what is taking place, friends? Do we realize that with three-fourths of the house being Catholic, that they're going to be pushing for Sunday worship even harder? Mm -hmm. 
They'll be pushing for us to accept the mark of the beast. Are we going to be prepared for the soon coming changes, my friends? Are we going to be able to handle the changes that will affect our daily lives? We have to be ready. And if we are not ready, again, we have no one to blame but ourselves. As we're preparing for the Spring Prophecy Seminar, which will begin on Friday, April 1st, do we understand that Satan is going to use all of his powers to shut it down? Do we understand what we're up against? Why it's so important to be on our knees and in our word every single day? Every chance that we get? As I was talking to a, a someone at work just the other day and I was engaging them with Bible studies, what she said to me is that I work so much that I'm too tired to study. We can get to that point where all these other things are taking over in our lives and we don't have time for Jesus. Satan is going to try to stop us. But ultimately, friends, we have a choice. We have to be prepared, my brothers and sisters, if we want to stand under the banner of Christ. We have to be ready for persecution in and out of the church. The book Evangelism, page 100 by Ellen G. White, <clears throat> titled Satan's Efforts to Divide Workers. And I talk about this because here at Three Angels, we're going to be doing a lot of things, a lot of things uh, to get the word out. Bible studies and, and the meetings that we're going to be having. And even after the, the seminar, we're going to be going into some more classes. And we're, you know, we're about teaching here. We're not about a lot of... Uh, different things. We, we want to teach and, and help the people to be prepared. Yes. Yes. That's what our goal is because we love you. That's right. You know, I, I keep saying this, but it's so funny. I know you guys have heard it too, but I remember Pastor Haynes saying, you know, he, when he was in uh, Vietnam, he said, what if I started uh, celebrating in the midst of the war? I would get killed because I'm not, I, my focus is on celebrating. I want, to, I want to celebrate when my feet hits the streets of heaven. Amen. That's when we celebrate. Yes. There's no time to do it now. Right. Right. It says, as we begin active work for the multitudes in the cities, the enemy will work mightily to bring confusion, hoping thus to break up the working forces. Some who are not thoroughly converted are in constant danger of making the suggestions of the enemy as the leading spirit of God. As the Lord has given us light, let us walk in the light. In other words, those that are not converted, those that are not studying, those that, that don't know, when Satan comes in, he's going to bring something that sounds so good, it feels so good, but it's deception. Right. Right. And we will not be able to decipher That's between right. truth and error. Right. In closing, I'm just going to read these verses to you. You can write them down. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, if you want to write them down. I'm not going to go through them. It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all the things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. We have hope that whatever we're going to go through in this battle, Jesus said he will be with us. Yes. Let's hold to that promise. Yes. Amen. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Let's not be afraid to walk up on somebody's doorstep when things don't look right. Let's not be afraid to speak the truth in and out of season. 
Let's not be afraid, my church family. Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. 1 Corinthians 2.5. 1 Corinthians 2 5, it says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Hebrews 11, 1 and 6. Hebrews 11, 1 and 6. It says, Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Moving to 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seeks him. Amen. We have to keep the faith, my brothers and yes. sisters. Yes. Are we ready to finish this course? Mm -hmm. Are we ready to put on the armor of God, finish this course? Because it says, the promise is, there will be a crown of righteousness for us in heaven. Mm -hmm. I want that reward, don't you, my brothers and sisters? Yeah. Yeah. You play something, please. As time goes on, I bet you here. As time goes on, we have to understand what the enemy is trying to do. And the one thing he's trying to do is to make sure that we're all lost. He wants us all lost. Why? He can't get to God, so the next best thing is his children. Don't wait, my brothers and sisters, if you have a desire. If you have a desire to take Bible studies and to understand and know truth and to be baptized into this church, I'm asking that you raise your hand now. I'm asking you that you raise your hand that all of heaven will see that you have stood for Jesus. If you are not a body or a part of this body of believers and you want to be baptized into this true church, I'm asking that you raise your hand. For some reason, things have gotten hard and we may have lost sight on life and about what the Lord expects of us. If you feel that you want to come back home and you want to be rebaptized, I'm asking you to raise your hand. It's so easy to get caught up. It's so easy to be deceived. But as long as we have Jesus, and taking that first step is saying, I'm a sinner and I know that I want to be saved. That's all. I'm asking you not to wait. You do not, we do not know what's going to happen when we leave here. We can't go on as business as usual. When we leave here, we need to be on a mission. If you want to take that stand today, I'm asking you whether it's rebaptism or whether you want to take studies and to be baptized, I'm asking you to please raise your hand where you are. As three angels move in the direction of evangelism, continue to move. As we witness to the world and to the people of this community, if there's someone that want to join us, you would like to join our church by transfer, I'm asking you to do so. We need your help. Amen. We need to know that you want to be a part of God's true word in time church. As I pray, and you have a desire that you want to take the stand for Jesus, please raise your hand and see one of the elders. But please don't wait, my brothers and sisters. Please don't wait. My church family, I love you. And I want to be saved, and I want to see you saved. You imagine that we see each other in heaven, we see those that have passed on in heaven. If we do not get our lives together right now, we won't see each other, and we won't see those that we know may make it to heaven. 
I want to be there, and I want to see you there, and I want you to see me there. Please don't wait, church family. Don't wait, my friends. Father in heaven, please be with us. Help us to understand and recognize the things that are taking place, Lord, and we have but a short time. We want to be ready, Lord, whether it's seeing your precious face, Lord, or, we, or, or before we meet our death, Lord, we want to be ready so when, we, when you do come, that we can meet you in the air in peace. Yes. Forgive us, Lord, of our sins that we have committed, Lord, and if there's one person out here that the Holy Spirit is touching their heart, Lord, please do not, Lord, please be with them. Please, Lord. Satan wants to distract them. He wants to put doubt in their mind. He wants, to, he wants them lost, Lord. He wants us lost. And if there's anyone, Lord, that wants to be saved when you come, please touch their hearts and their minds, Lord. Do not give us rest or peace until we we have solely and committedly, Lord, 100% committed to you, Lord. Surrender everything to yes. you. Yes. We ask, Lord, that we get the negative things out of our lives that is yeah. stopping us from having that relationship with you. Mm -hmm. Lord, here at Three Angels, we need you, Lord. Mm -hmm. Send those, Lord, that are looking. Send those that are wanting to do work, not to just come to warm the pews, Lord, but we need workers in the vineyard. Yes, Lord. Ask, Lord, in a very special way that you touch our hearts and our minds. Please, Lord, keep us and guide us. Watch over us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and mercy. And please bless everyone here that we will be fervent and serious about your soon coming that we can be prepared. In Jesus' name, we do pray. Let the church say amen. Amen. amen.